Right. Never tried to use one of these things for something useful before. <laughs> <laughs> I've got the purpose of the post. Will I put that on for you? Give me a sec here, I'm just going to get out the small pieces. I think I need some number of these. What's one right there? I can see that, can I? Are you closing that one in front? So one of the speakers on the front of the lectern. If you walk around in front of you, you're going to get feedback. Okay. Oh, I think it's HDMI, yeah, but it is the preferred option. So try using the one you've got. Wasn't HDMI preferred? No, but like VGA, do we? Yes. Okay. No, I'll pull it in power before we're finished as well. Just go on. I can plug into a different thing. No. Perhaps I should plug into a different one. I can plug into something else instead. My double thing. Yeah, right. I'll try this display port one. Alright, that's about as much as I know about computers. Try your one. That one? This is the VGA core, isn't it? Yep. Look at that, there was an insufficient amount of DRM in my other choices of dongle. Yeah. Alright, <laughs> good. Yeah, and then what's after me? There's like nothing after me? After me. Okay. Because I've got to be talking about this and then Rust stuff, which I could just talk to people told me to stop. So I can fill up whatever time you want. Okay. So when do you want me to finish? Three o'clock. Right, okay. Three quarters an hour. Cool. Right. Yeah, no, right. No, right. Yeah. Wow, that looks really big and red. Yeah, apologies for that. I've got a Mac this week because my Lenovo died and is in repairs at the moment, and I have no idea how to use it. Um, I got as far as installing VirtualBox with Debian on it, and that's, that's, that's all I do now. So. Right. Um, so, this is just a talk about some things I've been trying the last couple of weeks. Um, it's a talk with sort of more questions rather than, uh, than answers. Uh, but I thought it might be interesting, some of the things I've discovered along the way might be interesting for people. Um, I'm certainly no expert in any of these areas and I haven't finished packaging uh, Rust for Debian, so this is all very much kind of what I've learned so far and I think is accurate. So please, please tell me where I'm wrong or where I should do something better. First of all, Rust. Rust is a new programming language uh, being developed by the Mozilla folks. Um, it's really interesting, it's got a lot of very interesting ideas. I think it's a very interesting community developing and a very interesting attitude behind the development. Um, so I'm very um, keen to see what happens with it. And I've been looking at it for uh, close to a year now. I've been sort of following along with development and trying out the, the nightly snapshots and the um, pre-releases they've made. 
Um, they're building up to a 1.0 release very soon now. They've just shipped 1.0 alpha, I think, last week or something. Um, two days ago, yeah. Their original timeline that I saw in December had them shipping 1.0 in February, and it looks like they're, they're on track to doing that. Um, so very soon now we'll have 1.0 release. Um, it's a compiled language. It's, it's a little like C, C++. It's down that end of things. Um, compiles to an executable that you run. It's strongly typed. Um, it's not at all like Python and, and Perl and Ruby and those, those things. It's, it's down the C end. Um, for the purposes of the first half of this talk, which I'll be talking about the packaging, um, the Rust compiler is written in Rust. This is actually not unusual for languages. Uh, the Haskell compiler is written in Haskell. The Python compiler requires some Python to get going. Um, the C compiler, of course, is written in C. Um, so this isn't actually that unusual. Um, but it's what makes the packaging a lot more interesting. Um, at the end of this talk, I'll give a little bit of a blurb about Rust, the language itself, um, and just talk to people who told me to stop, basically, at that point. So um, we'll see how we go. But if you've got any questions, just, just shout. What um, are It would be a reasonable... Ch oh, sorry, the question was uh, somewhat jokingly, when are you proposing Rust as an official language for OpenStack? Um, the answer would be never, given that the OpenStack community is strongly Python bigoted biased. Um, <laughs> um, it would be suitable for those problems after the 1.0 release is shipped. Um, anyway, so the challenges in packaging this. So when you're packaging a new toolchain, how do you get the first package? You need to somehow miraculously break the circular build dependency and cause the first package to exist, you know, come fully formed uh, out of nothing. Um, and then somewhat related to that, there's what happens when a new architecture comes along. Um, once you've got it working on one architecture, how do you get it on another one? The advantage there is, of course, you can use, you can cross-compile from your first architecture is, is basically the, the answer there. Um, some unique challenges with Rust. Uh, Rust knows about cross-compiling and has multiple you know, multi-arc sort of support built into the language. Um, and all of the Rust toolchain uh, and the various features around that do a lot of string matches against the GNU sort of architecture triple. Um, and it really wants exactly that architecture triple. And of course, the official architecture triple for a Linux system uh, from as generated by the GNU uh, config.guest and sort of related scripts is x 64 unknown Linux GNU. And on Debian, we decided, well, we're not unknown. We know what we are. So we're just going to be x 64 Linux GNU. Um, at the moment in my packaging, I'm just blindly glossing over this and saying, I'm just going to insert the string unknown in there. Off we go. Um, but I strongly suspect that'll come back to bite me at some point. Uh, the worst that happens there is I have to define a new architecture as far as Rust is concerned, which is called uh, x86 Linux GNU. That won't be so bad, I don't think. Um, but so far, I'm just ignoring that problem. Um, the more interesting complication is Rust is still a very fast-moving language. And from the conversations I've had with the upstream devs, even after 1.0, they still want to be very agile and be very um, unrestrained in, in what they can do with the language. They've, they've tagged certain language features as stable. Um, they basically have, they don't call them that, there's basically a stable, testing, unstable kind of split of, of language features. And when you're writing Rust code, you can tag it and say, I only want to use stable features. Um, and the compiler will tell you, oh, and, and when you're writing a library, you can say, this is still experimental, this particular function call, I'm not happy with that API just yet. Um, and the compiler can tell you, you know, error, you tried to use some, some experimental features in the program you said you only wanted to be limited to the stable subset. Um, so the Rust compiler itself, they don't want to be limited to only the stable subset. Um, which I think is a mis I think is something they're going to have to change, but so far they don't want to do that, and we'll see how they go. So currently they have an incompatible change to Rust about several times a week, sometimes several times a day at the moment. Um, uh, which, when you're writing Rust, is fine because you're writing you're only using a smallish set, and you probably won't have to change anything in the Rust code that you've written yourself. But the Rust compiler itself is a very large project that uses all of the Rust features. How fast is the 
I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. Um, it would be in the tens a day of commits, and the ones that are tagged to breaking change are realistically probably a few a day on, on, a, on a bad day. Post 1.0, I suspect that won't be the case. Yeah, yeah, or, or the language features they break won't be the stable ones, obviously. They'll be the features that were tagged experimental anyway. Um, sorry, the question there was what about post 1.0? So anyway, for the purposes of the packaging, what this means is you need to build depends on a very narrow and very recent Rust compiler. And you can only really use that to build the next compiler and no other one. And then you have to use that compiler to build the next one and no other one. Um, so some extra challenges there. Uh, some terminology, which I'll be referring to later on. The compiler is broken out into stages like many other compilers. GCC uses similar terminology here. Um, the stage zero compiler is the one they just expect to already be installed, the one that's already available. Uh, when you start compiling, you somehow magically acquire a stage zero, uh, and then you use that to compile stage one, which is a very simple, minimal compiler. It doesn't have any libraries built in. In GCC, you can't use floating point and things like that in, in stage one. Um, uh, in Rust, you don't have any of the support languages, so you can't use a number of exotic language constructs. Um, but it's a basic Rust compiler, and then you use that to build stage two, which is effectively a full compiler uh, with libraries and everything. Um, in Rust, they use the stage two to build stage three, and stage three is theoretically identical to stage two. Um, they do that mostly as a test to check that they converge at that point. Uh, and then stage three is what gets shipped, what, what gets installed on your system is, you know, user bin Rust C, the Rust compiler. Um, so again, the interesting part here for Debian packaging is stage zero, and where do you get this from? <laughs> so normally when you type make install, or when you type make uh, off the upstream, upstream source, it goes and downloads a pre-built stage zero minimal compiler uh, off the internet, you know, wget in the middle of the script there somewhere. Um, and it uses that to build the rest. Uh, as someone using the upstream source, it works perfectly fine. It's very easy. It's, it's you know, simply a make, make, install, you're done. Uh, but for Debian packaging, that's not so good. We don't want to build these downloading binaries on the fly. We generally, as a community, don't like the idea of blobs that we can't point to the source for and build ourselves. But for the very, very first package, there's no other way around this. You must have a Rust compiler somehow that has appeared. Um, so our choices really are download like the upstream source does. That's not so nice in an auto-build environment like BuildEase. Um, I could, as a Debian packager, download it beforehand and ship it in the Debian source alongside the, the, the Rust source I'm about to compile. Here's, here's the Rust source. Here's the compiler you should use. Um, that would work from a hermetic sense and a, and a re reproducibility sense and not requiring network access while building. Um, in Debian, again, we really don't like binary blobs. And even though we can tell ourselves that we could possibly go and build every version of these Rust compilers back through history, it doesn't feel very nice. So what I think I'm going to have to go with uh, is the third option, which is simply I make sure every version of Rust compiler <laughs> that is required is uploaded to Debian and is in unstable and is used for the next version of the Rust compiler. And if I was doing that right now, that would mean shipping a new Rust compiler to unstable several times a day, or certainly several times a week. But there's, I don't see a fourth choice here. Um, I had a little bit of thinking about the option number two there and thought, does that mean I should go in contrib because I've got a, a you know, a, perhaps a non-free binary or perhaps a binary that we're not happy with, um, but then that's a bit strange too. So, If we were another distribution, um, I think you'd be very happy with either one or two and we just ship it if we were less demanding of ourselves. Um, and the output's still the same, right? The final compiler is still the same no matter which one of these you choose. So here's what this looks like in Debian terminology. So you have a Debian control file that lists you know, all your metadata about your package. Um, the general problem is that first box there where you're going to have, I'm going to build a Rust-C package and it's going to build depend on a Rust-C package. That's, that's what the circular dependency looks like. Um, and in particular, it's going to be a, a particular version of it. 
So I went looking around as to how to do this. For other languages, C, this is still a problem, but the problem arises less often because the languages are moving uh, is much slower. And for GCC, they're very liberal and they say you can compile with any C compiler, not, not just another GCC. Um, but the same problem still exists. And the solutions there uh, historically have been, well, dear Debian Packager, you're a very clever person. Here, have some files on disk and an editor. Enjoy. And you would open up Debian Control in your favorite editor and you would just comment out the bits that build depend on itself. And then you would get a C compiler from somewhere and you would magically, or a better example might be a Haskell compiler you get from somewhere, and then you would use the Haskell compiler already installed and use a local bin to build the Haskell compiler package that you're about to build. And then you would uncomment the bits from the Debian control file, <laughs> and away you go. Um, now, there's some new features uh, coming somewhat through Ubuntu and somewhat through various Google Summer of Code projects over the last year. As far as I can work out, these aren't used anywhere in the packages yet, but they exist in the tool chain. And they're documented. Um, and so this is what I'm trying to use now, these very, very new features. So the first one is uh, build profiles. Um, you can see on the right-hand side box there, you put some little angle brackets things. And you can list profiles in your build depends. And it's basically a filter for if you're building with the, in this case, not with the stage one profile, you should consider this build dependency. So in this case, I say, I would like to build with the stage one profile, and that looks like that dpkg build package command there. And then that says, right, I'm going to ignore those build dependencies. Um, and it's all done automatically, you don't have to use an editor to achieve the same result. Um, now the way I've chosen to do this as well, I'm going to build a Rust-C bootstrap package, which I only build if I'm building in the stage one profile, build profile. And I know that that's a minimal package, that is not fully featured. I'm only going to build the stage one compiler. I could build the full compiler, but I'm not going to bother wasting that much CPU. I only build the stage one compiler. I put that in a package, and I intend to never upload that to the archive. So you would build this. It spits out uh, a rusty bootstrap.deb. I would dpkg minus i that, and then I should be able to immediately go and build the full uh, Rust-C package using a normal dpkg build package because the build depends are now satisfied using the Rust-C bootstrap package. That's the theory anyway. I haven't quite got that far in the packaging, but I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure that'll work out as, as described there. So that's one new feature. Um, this turns into, uh, just see a bit more details there, this turns into setting the dev build profile environment variable. So in your Debian rules or anywhere else, you can check that environment variable and enable or disable certain features, um, uh, depending on what you want to do with that. So I'm changing the build target that I build later on. Um, uh, and dpkg build package has support to pass through the right flags and environment variables down through um, the various dpkg tools and your Debian rules file. So that tool chain is, as far as I can tell, all there. Uh, and even apt, in fact, can run, if you do app source dash dash compile, it will also set the flags to dpkg build package appropriately. So that's, that feels like it might work okay. <laughs> so far, uh, I've got most of the way through the packaging and it seems to be working out okay. This one I know much less about and it's something I've never tried with or without the new way of doing things. Um, so I'm much less certain about this part of it. Uh, new architecture, new architecture comes along. The theory is very simple. The theory is you use a cross compiler on an existing architecture. You have all of the build dependencies installed on the local architecture. You use the cross compile to make the first couple of packages for the new architecture. And then you can install them and away you go. Um, and again, in the past, that used to involve running editors and hacking things around and using a cross compiler that you might have got from, from some other source. It might even have been Yocto or Open Embedded or something and you use your cross-compile environment to bootstrap that first, that first uh, build essential set. Uh, there are also some new features here, which again, nothing that as far as I can tell uses yet, but the pieces seem to all be there. 
The idea is to use multi-arc support. So you know nowadays Debian can install more than one architecture on your local system. Um, this is usually only used for AMD64 and i386 being installed simultaneously, so you can run Wine. <laughs> it's about the only use for this <laughs> rather complex feature. Um, but you can do this as well. You can get any architecture. You can tell your local DPKG about it. And then you can install packages from that architecture. You might not be able to run the binaries from there, but you can install the packages on disk. So in this case, we say, I'm going to tell about the new architecture, and that way the various libraries can be installed from that architecture. And you can do apt-get source, and it'll pull down the build dependencies from that other architecture, but run the compile using binaries from your local architecture. And hopefully, that'll all just work out. Under the hood, this sets these environment variables. There's a family of environment variables about the build environments uh, and the target environment that you're trying to work on. That you're trying to build for. Uh, and yeah, um, so long as you've built your Debian rules set up and your upstream source deals with cross compiling, uh, which Rust does, and my packaging hopefully does, um, that should all work out just okay. That's, I'm a lot less certain about all that part. Um, so if anyone knows about these pieces, I'd be very interested in talking to you after this. Um, and again, this is still, I don't see any existing packages from my look around at GCC and Haskell and the various likely suspects. There's some experimental packaging that's taking advantage of these, which are proof of concepts. Uh, but again, as far as I can tell, the pieces are actually in the base system, so I should be able to use it. All right, and they're the two sort of documents that I've built a lot of this on and am and, and learning from as I work this out. Uh, particularly the first one has a lot of information. The second one talks uh, a bit more about the Ubuntu features and the Debian features, and it's a bit hard to tell what's landed where and things, but um, I think we're good. Yeah, um, and that was that part. Are there any sort of questions about that? There's not a lot of information there, I know, but mostly because it's something I'm still learning about. Um, but that's the principle of it. Um, the previous world was a lot more hacked up and using pre-existing cross tool chains, typically open embedded or something like that. Um, to make magic happen, and then you would rely on a clever person to make magic happen, and it would just work. Yeah. So there's another thing that someone was working on to do the stage zero, stage one, stage two automatically to teach the archive machines about the different stages. Uh, did you look into that? I don't think it's sort of polished and in the tool chain yet. I'm just curious if you looked into it and whether you think it would have worked for Rust. I don't know what you're referring to there, so no, I haven't. Um, teaching the archive. Oh, you mean breaking out separate packages for stage one versus stage two? That was, there were a couple of implementations discussed on DDevel. Okay. Um, I'll take it to the hallway, I think. Yeah, I'll go look that up. No, I, I'm not familiar with that. Um, I have messed quite a bit with Open Embedded previously, um, and Open Embedded, uh, or Yocto, as a lot of that community has, has regrouped around. Um, is a really impressive piece of work, and it's designed for embedded uses where cross-compiling is normal. <laughs> you, you often can't or certainly don't want to run your tool chain on your microcontroller, um, you, you, or even you know, an ARM phone or something. You really want to do it on your powered machine and then build binaries for your ARM that you then run there. So they have uh, a very strong, very clever, very powerful set of... Um, uh, packaging, essentially. They've got all of the upstream sources and patches to them where it didn't already work to make it work with cross-compiling. Um, and they can do things that we're nowhere near close to being able to do, like Canadian cross-compilers where you're building... I'm running... I was actually using this once. I was building uh, an unofficial Android um, toolchain, and I was building uh, on Linux, building a compiler that would run on Windows that when you ran that compiler would produce executables for Android. So that's called a Canadian cross-compiler where you have three architectures involved. Um, and the Yocto stuff deals with that just fine. Um, it's very, very impressive. Whereas the Debian stuff are only really getting to the point of thinking of the two um, architectures. Um, but, yeah, still better than before. Anyway, so... Questions? I'll jump on to some Rust language stuff. Um, there's another talk later on in the main conference uh, about some, uh, by someone a lot more qualified than me talking about using Rust in the 
um, how you would use Rust in the Mozilla sort of rendering engine. Um, so I'm certainly no expert here, but I'm just going to talk about it anyway because I can. I've got a microphone. Um, so it looks like C++, it uses LLVM underneath, so it's got quite sophisticated optimization and uh, cross-compiling and all the sort of features it, it gains from LLVM, um, including a debugger, the LLVM debugger, LDB, uh, which can be used to debug Rust binaries. Um, it unashamedly borrows lots of ideas from all around what's going on at the moment with language development. Um, it gets a lot of uh, strong type system from Haskell. It gets some of the interfaces and channel ideas from Go and from other uh, languages like Haskell. Um, it has a very strong, the sort of new thing it brings is a very strong ownership of data. Every piece of data is owned by exactly one owner at any point in time. And when, and when that owner is finished with the data, we're finished with that structure, it's deleted. No exceptions. Um, the compiler, to help you with this, the compiler has a very, uh, you can annotate things as, as pointer lifetime, and I'll show examples of this later. Um, you can say, I'll accept any pointer, my function can accept any pointer to this thing, so long as it has a lifetime of at least this. And you can name the lifetimes. And then I'm going to return a pointer that is, you know, has the same lifetime as that. Um, so the compiler can make quite strong assertions about when a pointer is valid and the memory that it points to is valid. So you should always have safe memory in your uh, Rust program. A seg fault or a dangling null pointer should be something that is impo impossible to happen, um, assuming the Rust compiler actually compiled your code. Um, the other thing that interests me particularly about Rust is that it has a very minimal runtime. All the cleverness happens in the compiler. When the compiler's finished and given you an executable, it looks a lot like what a C compiler would produce. It has almost no runtime, a couple of libraries that might get deal opened, but there's nothing very clever anymore at that point. So it's very easy, for example, to call into a Rust program from C or the other way around. You can create a .so from Rust and then deal open it from a C program and call functions in it, just like it was a C library. You can even go as far as doing embedded programming in Rust, where the embedded program itself doesn't have any of the cleverness and doesn't need any of it, but you've got a very safe program that is now running on that embedded program. Um, theoretically, I don't think anyone's tried it yet, but it's, it's something they're aiming towards, is you should be able to write a kernel module in Rust that then gets loaded up in what is otherwise a very C program. You can tag your structs and your functions as saying these should be C compatible and it makes sure it doesn't mangle the function name and it makes sure that the struct uh, padding and field ordering is the same as what a C compiler would do. So you can pass these straight through and you can get pointers from your C uh, program pointing into struct members and it should all just work. Uh, which is for me quite interesting because it makes it suddenly a very um, useful language for real world problems unlike some of these new ones like Go is a nice language as well in a lot of ways but you can't mix it well with existing code quite, quite to that extent. Okay, um, I started putting bits of programming language in here and realized that there was already a website that did that better than I could. In particular, it has uh, syntax highlighting in a way that looked better than I could do in my own slides. So I'm just going to borrow from here. Here is hello world, slash slash comments. They look just like normal. It looks like C++ or something like that or C from a, from a first glance. Um, Fn is a function declaration. Main is the main function. Uh, statements end in semicolons. Um, you'll notice there's an exclamation mark after println. That means println is a, a macro. It does a bit more than just a regular function call. Um, you can treat it like a function call, but you should be slightly aware that you can't. It does a bit more in the compiler. Um, in Rust's case. You can do things, they're not the same as printf format strings, but they achieve the same sorts of results. You can put curly braces in there and you can refer to arguments and substitute them in. Nothing very exciting. Um, as I said, because this is a macro, that's not being done at runtime, it's actually done at compile time. The compiler will parse the string during its compile and it'll break it up and it'll generate instead, you know, convert what the, what's a good example, the second line there, the second printlin, that will actually turn into make 31i as a string, and then print space days. It's not trying to actually interpret the format string at runtime like a regular C printf would do. 
So you get very accurate compile errors, of course, because it's already tried to do the hard work at compile time. There's a wonderful example of what macros can do, which I've, this site doesn't have examples of, which is the regex macro. There's a regex library, which is just like any other language would use a regex library, but it includes a regex colon macro. And if your regex is a literal that's already available at compile time, it'll parse that and generate it at compile time. So you're getting a full, not only do you get, first of all, uh, the compiler will error out if your regex is not valid, so you're getting checking at compile time of your regular expression, but you're also getting optimization of the LVM engine <laughs> as applied to your regular expression after it's been converted to all this code. So you don't even have to re-compile the regex at runtime, it's already happened for you, which is actually pretty impressive. Uh, and you can implement your own macros, but that's experimental. They still haven't worked out what they want the API to be like that, that and how they can guarantee um, forward compatibility. So you can do it, but it's a little questionable right now. Um, oh, and uh, of course, running the Rust compiler is very simple. It's just Rust C and the name of your source, usually .ending and .rs, and you get a binary. There's nothing very interesting there. Um, There's things like impression player and things like that. Yes, yes, I'll get them a little bit later. Yes, yeah, they work kind of the same way. Um, so variables look, uh, literals look like C, operators look like C, there's all the usual things you're used to. Um, one slight difference is you introduce a variable with let, you define a variable with let, um, and they're all read only by default. Um, unlike C, uh, everything in Rust, they try to make the laziness, the lazy version of typing it, <laughs> is the most flexible for the compiler. So it is read-only by default, and you have to type something extra to make it mutable, the MUT in that second variable up there. Um, fields in a struct can be reordered by default, and if you don't want that, you have to type something extra. Uh, and similar, there's lots of similar decisions like that all the way through where um, the lazy, laziest option is the most safe and the most aggressive for the compiler um, option, which is an interesting choice. Uh, any unused variable is a, uh, an error, a warning, unless you prefix it with an underscore, in which case it says it's okay that it's unused. Um, and you see the mutable example there in that they're trying to modify a mutable variable, um, which works because we've tagged it mute, but if you tried to modify the other one, it throws a compiler error. Uh, right. There are the usual types. There's string types, which is actually a pointer to, that's not the example I wanted, but anyway, there's a string type, which is a pointer to a string, kind of like a C string, a uh, char pointer. Um, and then booleans and various types of integers and floats, as you'd expect. Uh, there's a unit type, which only ever has the value empty prints. It's used in some places in the... Uh, templating engine later on where you don't really want to put a type in. Uh, type inference. You very rarely have to actually say what type you're using. Whenever you're declaring a function, you have to give types for the arguments and the return value. Almost everywhere else, you don't need to mention types. The compiler can work it out. The compiler goes, oh, I see you declared a variable there. Oh, I see you passed it to that function down there. Hmm, that function takes a float, therefore your variable must have been a float, uh, and similar sorts of things. Um, this example is an interesting one. The, the vec here is a, a vector, one of the built-in libraries, um, and it's a, a generic type. Uh, it's like a template type in C++. So it's a vector of something. You didn't say what type it was as part of the declaration, but later on you've pushed an element on there, and that element was an unsigned int, thanks to the U8 suffix, or an unsigned 8-bit int. So the compiler can then work out that, ah, vec must have been a vector of unsigned uh, U8 types. So if you tried then to do something that conflicted with that assumption, you'd get an error, because it would be now a type conflict. So it's, it's interesting, and you very rarely have to actually mention types. Uh, everything is an expression, which is another way of saying everything returns a value. There's no such thing as, like in C, you have an if block, and then you have a separate thing, which is that question mark colon, the ternary operator, 
for if you want to return values. In Rust, both those things are the same. There's no question mark colon, you just use if else, and the if else blocks have return values. The last statement in the if block is its value. So if you want to do the equivalent of a ternary, you do, that's not an example of it, um, here we go. You do the same thing. So there's one being treated like a regular if block. There's no kind of return value that's interesting there. It's returning actually the, the unity type, which is just discarded. This one down here is returning a value here and a different value here. So this is acting like the C ternary construct. Um, and the compiler will verify that both branches return something of the same type. Um, now this one needs, they didn't have to have this in the language, but they chose to make it so that this version where you're returning a value needs a semicolon at the end to make it look like this whole thing is a statement here, let begin equals something something semicolon. And if you, this one doesn't need a semicolon, and that's, they didn't have to do that in the language and they chose to because that's now a hint to the compiler to say, hey, I actually wanted to use a value from this. And the other one is, hey, I, I didn't want a value from this. And so if you mix up the two uses, it actually throws an error. It's able to tell, based on the presence of a semicolon, how you intended to use this if block. Yeah? Uh, well, it can, but, but it's always safe to throw away a value. And in the second example, sorry, the example was why don't I, the question was why don't you just infer that. And you certainly could have. But in the second example, I could have... Um, oh, you could have missed. I could have missed some syntax up here, and I would have gone to all this work here, and then discarded the 10 times n or the n minus 2 value. And the compiler couldn't have told me I was wrong, <laughs> because it's still, it's still valid. You're allowed to calculate something and throw away the value. So they make this so that if you put a semicolon after it says, oh, I meant to use that value, tell me if I didn't use it for some reason. It's just a thing. Uh, there are looping constructs like C that are interesting. There's a, a for over an iterator loop, and there's a loop, which is for infinite loops, and you've got continue and break like normal. Um, and you can break more than one level using a little label to refer to the one you want to break out of. Again, not anything particularly novel there compared to some other languages. Uh, here's the hash includes part. So instead of includes, you have modules, which are more like to use them, they're a little bit more like Python, where you use a module at the top there. You use a module, and it gets entered into your namespace, and you can refer to things in there. Um, when you're defining them, they get defined like this with a mod keyword, and it's, it's not worth me going into details here. Um, but you can declare kind of namespace functions and those sorts of things. When you when these get compiled, they call the the compilation unit, the, the, the dot .so or the dot .a, is called a crate. In C, and particularly in sort of packaging experience that Debian's had, you remember a few examples like OpenSSL, where for a while there was two versions of OpenSSL uh, floating around, and they had um, and various other things would depend on one of those two particular versions. But the two versions of, the, of the, the library had the same symbols in them. The same, you know, I, can't, I don't know what OpenSSL symbols are, you know. OpenSSL sign this thing for me function. And this brought all sorts of very subtle problems because when you're in C, you've got one sort of symbol namespace. You can do lots of tricks with the dynamic linker. But the fundamental problem is you have, you don't know whether you mean the symbol from OpenSSL 1 or the symbol from OpenSSL 2. Uh, and one of the ways around that, probably the better way around that, is symbol versioning, where you can tag all of your symbols in the dynamic linker as, you know, with the particular version you want. And then when you link your program, you say, link against exactly this version. And then if later on you deal open another library that linked against the old version, they're both referring to just their version of, open, of OpenSSL. And that was kind of the, the solution that Debian had to go through. Rust has that same thing, but from the beginning, because they've learned from that experience. So every library, gets built with, uh, it doesn't put a semver on, it puts a, uh, like a checksum of the ABI effectively, the compiler used to compile it and various things about the library. Um, and that's your SO name. And all the symbols are tagged with that. So it's very straightforward to have somewhere in a, a Rust program two versions of the same library loaded up and used by different pieces of that Rust program. 
and the symbols won't conflict. It'll all just work out, um, which is interesting. Uh, yeah, pattern matching. A good example of this pattern matching was actually on the Rust front page, so I'll use this example. Here's another example of a Rust program which shows off a bunch of other features. So there's a for loop going over an iterator there, the for token in chars. So it has iterators built in. They're very simple. You can define your own um, and very nice syntax to use. Um, and then this match operation. Match is sort of like a select in C, a uh, switch statement, sorry, in C, uh, except normally it's, it's exhaustive. It makes sure that every single case is covered. If you're matching over an enumerator type, it'll say, are you matching every um, value in that enumerator type and give an error if you're not. You can do some wild cards. So the underscore at the bottom is the anything else match, uh, which will work fine. Um, and it's a lot more powerful. You can do a lot more things than what's in this simple example. But you see the match keyword used a lot in Rust. And so this example here is we're declaring an immutable program. Uh, we have a mutable accumulator, and then we're going over each of the um, tokens in this string. And if it's a plus, we are incrementing the accumulator by one. If it's a minus, we're decrementing. If it's a, you know, times by two, divided by two, and skipping over. So this will skip over the spaces in particular, the spaces between the characters. And we print it out. So, so when, uh, when, when, when the accumulator hits zero, then you divide by two. Yep. Good question. Uh, minus divide. Uh, is that right? Would that have done a zero? Yep. Divide zero by two. That's fine. Oh, divide zero by two. Yeah. Okay. So let's. All right. Fine. Do, 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 do. There you go. <laughs> um. So where was I? By example, that one there, right? Um, yeah, there are structures. Oh, so pattern matching. You can in the match statements, you can actually match on all sorts of interesting things. You can match on literal values. You can destructure uh, like tuples, for example. Here, um, you can do a lot of very powerful things, which you certainly won't understand from my simple showing you an example there. Um, there's structures. Structures are boring. They're just like C structs. Uh, there's generics. So these are like the templates in C++. They're more powerful than templates in C++ and not quite as powerful as what you can do in Haskell. They're somewhere in the middle. Um, but, yeah, whatever. So you can say a list of something or a list of something that implements this particular behavior, for example. So you can have um, uh, abstract types that build on other abstract types, and they don't care what that other one is, so long as that other one also implements certain types of behavior. Um, so you can build quite complicated things all around abstract types. Um, here's where the memory ownership comes in. So you can have, if you're a struct, you can have another structure inside you, and you obviously own that quite clearly, because it's, it's, it's embedded in your larger structure. You could also have a reference, a pointer, to that structure stored somewhere else. Um, and you can have uh, a box is an owned pointer. So you're pointing to it and saying, and I also own this. So again, if I get destroyed, you should also destroy that other thing over there. Um, and this is where some of the real type safety comes in. If you end up passing this, watch this trick, where, yeah, borrowing they call it. So taking a reference to something is known as borrowing. And you can pass a read-only reference to something as many times as you like. You can have lots of read-only references, and they're all pointing to the same thing. You can only have one mutable reference. And if you have a mutable reference, while that's in scope, you can't have any other reference, mutable or readable, or read-only. So this is where a lot of the type safety comes in, one and only one owner. And if you pass by value to a function, you are passing ownership of that whole object to that function. And if you try and use it later on in your line of code, it'll say, nope, sorry, you've given it up. You've handed it over to someone else. Um, so this leads to an interesting effect of, what's a good example here? Ownership moves, yeah. 
So the most surprising thing, probably coming from a C background, is it equals. doesn't mean what you might think it means. On a complex object, if you do let A equals B, you are passing ownership of everything that was in B to A. You are moving B to A. And you can no longer use B anymore. Let A equals B, print B, compile error. <laughs> Which is probably the most surprising thing about this language coming from a C-like language. Now, if that type implements a copy operator, which of course int does, and lots of your basic types, then let a equals b is fine. What it actually does is a copy, and you now have two copies, which are just fine. But for a big complex type, it'll be a move. Um, you never get caught by surprise there, because the compiler knows very well which one of those two it's done, and will give you compile errors if you expected the wrong behavior than what it implemented. Um, uh, lifetimes. Lifetimes are a little quirky to explain, so I don't know how this is going to go, but you say things like, I have a reference to something, and that something must last for at least, at least this long. And then you can say, my function takes a pointer that must be some lifetime, and then it returns a pointer of the same lifetime. Might be a, a common thing to do. You're basically taking a pointer and doing something, and then probably returning the same pointer. And then your compiler who, who calls you knows that, ah, that argument you passed in, that point you get out, that point you get out is valid for just as long as that thing I put in there. So I can use it in some surrounding code quite a bit. Um, and there's lots of sort of stuff around it, but the compiler can make very strong assertions about how long, how much of your program a certain pointer is valid for, uh, which is quite powerful. And again, you never end up with sort of dangling pointers because it's, it's just not allowed to construct them. Uh, there's a, you have closures, you can create functions and callbacks, which is something that Go can do, but something that other C-like languages have a pretty tough time with. Um, they use the uh, slightly unusual um, pipe symbols to introduce the closure arguments. Uh, and that's most of the interesting features. The rest is getting very esoteric. Um, you'll see things like Result. No, I wanted option. Where's option? Option. Uh, option is used frequently. It's a, a type that has something or none. And so you use this often where you might use a null pointer in C. You might say it's a pointer to something or it's null. In Rust, you have the option type, which is the same sort of idea. Except now when using a match statement, you must include a case for none, or is it the compiler? So you have to have thought about the none case, and you have to do something sensible. And in particular, you can't get a pointer to what's inside the option structure unless you've got some code that has said, is it some and not none? Um, so it's, it's always safe. You can never get a null pointer where you want, weren't expecting one, a null value where you weren't expecting one. Um, from an implementation point of view, it has an unsafe idea. You can say, this bit of code is unsafe, and then all these checks are out the window. You can do anything you like. And so a lot of the standard library, the, the hairy bits of the standard library, is implemented using unsafe blocks. So the library itself is implemented in fairly straightforward Rust, even when it's doing something amazingly scary like atomically reference counted shared objects. Um, and all it is is a little unsafe block that goes, okay, increment the value, increment my, my reference counter, get the pointer to the value inside, now exit the unsafe block, everything is safe again now. I know it's not going to be freed because I took care of that with the reference counter and return a pointer again. So as long as the memory safety is guaranteed again once you exit the unsafe block, everything is fine. Um, so it's, it's very powerful and very easy to do something, to get it out of the way if you need to do something scary. Um, when you have threads, you have tasks, which are normally threads, um, and you can't share anything between tasks, which is interesting, unlike Go. Again, very strong ownership. This bit of data is owned by that task, and the other guy can't even look at it. You can pass objects between tasks, and if you want to do something like uh, a shared cache, that's when you use this, this arc, atomically reference counted type, which uses a little unsafe bit of code <laughs> to say, okay, I'm gonna cheat. I'm gonna look at my bit of memory and go, yeah, yeah, whatever. 
It's read only, but it's reference counted, and I, you can get a reference, and you can get a reference, and you can get a reference, and when you've all got rid of your references, then I'll free up the shared object. Um, but unless you use one of those sorts of uh, unsafe options, or one of those options that uses unsafe to do something scary, you've got every thread owning one bit of data, and you can pass them explicitly using like a send channel idea to another thread. Um, so you'll never have, should never have uh, data races of those sorts. Um, you can still, of course, have races to external resources if you're creating files on disk and then someone else is deleting them. Um, you can still confuse yourself that way, but hopefully it won't be uh, a memory corruption type of race. Um, so anyway, this, is Rust. this is why I quite like it. It's got some really interesting ideas. Um, it has, the only other bit not mentioned here that was interesting is Cargo, which is a Rust packaging tool um, that helps you build, uh, it takes the place of make and autoconf and uh, distribution sort of channel and all those sorts of those problems. Um, and it's quite interesting. It has a few interesting ideas of its own. Um, it's designed to be portable, even to non posix places like Windows. Um, so it doesn't call out to make. It has that functionality itself. Um, it has an autoconf-like idea, but they said shell is a bit hard to guarantee is going to be everywhere. Mm, what can we assume is, exists on the target platform? Only a Rust compiler. So it has the ability to run some compile and run some Rust code, which may in turn use lots of other libraries, so it doesn't have to be simple Rust code, that then gets run, works out some things about your platform you're on, and then is used to influence the actual build proper for your package on that platform, which sounds weird, but is quite novel, interesting. Um, anyway, if you have questions, come and ask me, then I should stop talking now. Um, but by all means, tell me about, ask me questions, and I'll tell you about it. I've been trying to write a bit of code in Rust over the last couple of months. Um, and I've been using both Python and Rust, and they're kind of completely opposite languages in everything they do.